Hi, Chris Noel here. I've written a film treatment and I'm billing it as the world's first realistic Bigfoot movie. As we all know, in the 42 years since The Legend of Boggy Creek came out, all Sasquatch movies have been either on one end of the spectrum or the other. Either they outrageously demonize this species or else they present it as a cuddly and domesticated version of ourselves. These two extremes are very reductive and narrow-minded and stem from really a lack of imagination on our part and also a lack of concrete knowledge. I've been lucky enough to have access to um, people's first-hand experiences with Sasquatch who have been generous enough to share their testimonials in my books. For example, Our Life with Bigfoot, which represents the main habituation sites uh, of the earlier book, Sasquatch Rising, 2013. There is another recent movie uh, called Letters from the Big Man, and this does in fact depict um, a, a plausible interaction between this woman, the main character, Lily, and a male Sasquatch. But I don't consider this primarily a Bigfoot movie. Um, I think that the Sasquatch in, in Letters from the Big Man um, comes mostly to represent nature. And the main plot point of the movie is a conflict between c conservationists and land developers and, and uh, logging, the logging industry. So I think that the, the, the Sasquatch there um, is an emblem um, for the nature that needs to be conserved. And it's a very um, polemical movie, which isn't good or bad in itself. But it doesn't portray the, the issue of Sasquatch themselves and of interaction between Sasquatch and human beings as the core of the plot itself. And that's what I'm trying to do um, here in Visiting Giants. I'm trying to explore the rich territory between the two extremes that I mentioned earlier um, so that we can see nuances of various members of the Sasquatch family and how they differ just like the human family members differ from one another. And I'm trying to imaginatively enter um, into the reality that could be behind um, a lot of the behavior that people in tens of thousands have reported throughout North America and to tell a plausible story uh, from the point of view of both people and Sasquatch but on equal footing while giving plenty of ground to the Sasquatch world itself as best a human being can contemplate it. So Act One begins with the human family having recently moved to a house at the edge of a vast wilderness. Um, the house was on the market for strangely cheap and uh, they don't know why but we later piece it together. They move from the city because the father has just lost his job and the family is kind of at loose ends. The husband and wife aren't getting along very well. The, the father is sort of lost. The, the mother is glued to her computer because she develops websites. There's a 13-year-old girl named Georgia and she's just completely pissed off that she had to be wrenched away from her friends and she spends most of her free time Skyping with them. And then you have the eight-year-old boy, Danny, um, he is the only one who's delighted to be here. His imagination is fired up by the forest around them. And he really longs to explore and craves adventure. All winter long he's been looking at maps of, of the area and the, the mountains that are right nearby. Spring arrives. The family is at a, a, an emotional low point. Everybody's kind of in their own bubble and it's fragmented and they begin experiencing a typical suite of Sasquatch overtures. Pebbles tossed onto the roof and rolling down, slaps to the side of the house in the middle of the night, um, stick and tree structures in the woods, 
the parents are too preoccupied and too kind of mired in their own emotional misery to, to notice or um, appreciate the um, significance of what's going on. Uh, Danny, the boy, is the one who finds the tree structures and the stick structures in the woods. And he looks on, on the internet and finds that these have been associated historically with Sasquatch activity and he gets completely psyched. He tries to convince his family, but in vain. Um, his sister, uh, 13-year-old Georgia, scoffs at him and his overactive imagination. Secretly, though, Georgia has been having her own special overtures. Um, she gets gifts on her windowsill, such as uh, feathers in a little pattern and pretty rocks. And she takes these and, and leaves her own items in, in exchange, like a, a comb and um, a, a book from her childhood, an anklet of hers. And these usually get taken uh, by the next morning. Um, she also increasingly he starts hearing tapping at, on her window and she's both scared and intrigued. She feels chosen. She, uh, she does connect this with what her little brother is on about, but she doesn't want to admit it to him. She wants to um, keep this all to herself. Um, so she feels freaked out, but also, um, as I say, chosen and, and drawn to whoever is paying attention to her. Um, she, she finally forces herself to look at the window and doesn't see anything, and she, she goes over and looks down, can't see anything. Uh, we later find out why. One night, Danny goes out of the house in the middle of the night with a sleeping bag and the family dog. They have um, a big uh, Bernese mountain dog, um, and so Danny goes out there, and, and they both go to sleep kind of just over the edge in, into, the, into the woods. Um, and he's woken up by the sound of a, of a tree being pushed I and mean, it crashes down right next to him, which is something incidentally that, that's happened to me in real life. Unlike what I heard, he hears heavy footsteps running away from that tree and he of course freaks out and, and runs back in the house, but the dog chases um, whatever it is and, and Danny can hear the, the fading barks off into, off into the night. The dog doesn't come back. Um, the next morning, the dog's still not back. And everybody, especially the kids, are plunged into depression over this. Um, there's a lot that I'm leaving out, but th this is just the outline of Act 1 uh, I want to share with you. Why am I sharing this? Because um, I would like uh, to reach out to anyone who wants to read the whole thing. I'm not worried about people stealing the idea because I have registered the copyright to it. And I'm making this video, which proclaims that it's mine on this date. Um, so, anyone who has an interest in reading the, the PDF of this uh, summary, this treatment, and especially if you have contacts in the film industry and might want to help move this project before the eyeballs of someone who, who may be in position to develop it, um, I, I'd love to be in touch with you. So write me either through Facebook under Christopher Noel or through YouTube on this channel. So that night, the parents go out for an emergency dinner together to try to figure out their future. This missing dog has kind of um, shaken them to the point of wanting to seek some kind of clarity. The kids stay home, and because her little brother is so distraught, um, Georgia allows him to choose what movie they're going to watch together on Netflix, and he chooses Harry and the Hendersons. So they're, they're watching this, they're watching this together, they're enjoying it. And from an outside perspective, we, we see the, the, the house of the family and the window of the living room and the flickering lights of the, of the movie. Um, and we see a huge head and shoulders a silhouette at, at, at the window watching the kids watch Harry and the Hendersons. We go inside and we see that the kids are watching the scene in which Harry is learning how to sit and everything's very um, pleasant and, and playful and the kids are very entertained. We see their faces all relieved, kind of distracted from the dog situation and allowing themselves to feel that the real life monster movie that they are kind of living through here um, it really just comes down to um, a, a big old teddy bear of a figure. So they're watching this movie, and all of a sudden, this shattering shriek 
and roar comes from the window. And they look and they see the face of a Sasquatch. His nose is all crooked. His face is, is really ugly and hateful. We find out later why. Um, and, and he's got in his arms their dead dog. In Act 2, we shift to the Sasquatch family's point of view. And we, it's a few days earlier. We get a chance to replay from their perspective uh, what they see going on with the human family. They've been watching the human family, as Sasquatch do, uh, from a ridge about a quarter mile away. Sasquatch have excellent vision, so they're able to really focus in when they want to when they have extra time on what's going on with the human family because Sasquatch uh, are very curious about us. There's a, a, a father and a mother. The mother has um, a, an infant whom she nurses and who clings to her. There's also a, an adolescent boy who is the one who's been drawn to Georgia, the human girl all this time and has been tapping on her window and exchanging gifts with her. There is also uh, an old grandmother in the family and someone I'm calling the shady male who kind of stays on the outskirts of things and he has an obvious chip on his shoulder and he, he's the one with the uh, extremely crooked nose. During what follows we come to know the routine of this group, how they hunt during the night, they hunt for elk because this movie takes place in the Northwest. Um, during the day, they forage for roots and leaves and wood and frogs and fish, and they also sleep a lot in the daytime in, in a cave. The, the nuclear family sleeps in the, in the cave, but the shady male uh, beds down kind of over to one side in a dug out hollow in the dirt and covers himself with pine boughs. He's, he's on the fringe. When we first hear them talking amongst themselves, it's in their language and we see s subtitles in English. Um, but then after the first few lines, we hear their speech as English, um, translated for us by the movie. So we get to know how they see the human beings. Um, we also get to find out how the shady male came to his great bitterness. We have a flashback to when he was a young man, and he, as many young male Sasquatches seem to do, would stand in a road at night playing chicken with cars. And we, we see this scene in which um, a, a couple of cars come along and they, they swerve out of the way, they're freaked out, they swerve out of the way, and then comes this big truck. And we see illuminated in the dashboard lights the face of the trucker. And at first he's, you know, completely taken aback. And then his eyes take on this uh, gleeful menace. And he's saying, all right, all right, come on, you son of a bitch. And he bears right down on, on the, the Sasquatch standing there. And the Sasquatch doesn't yield any ground. And the trucker doesn't yield any ground. And he strikes him and throws the, the, uh, the, the Sasquatch through the air. And the trucker screeches to a halt, gets out with his flashlight and looking around. You're mine now. You're mine. And we see that, that our man, the, the, the uh, shady male, um, just barely manages to hobble off and we see his face uh, like a bloody mess, his nose broken. We also relive from the adolescent male Sasquatch's point of view the interaction with, with Georgia. And we also see him making tree structures uh, in the woods, uh, especially these sapling uh, arches where he like pulls these young trees over and pins them under rocks. He, uh, there was one scene that I didn't talk about in Act 1 where the uh, girl, Georgia, hears her mother, sounds for all the world like her mother, calling her, Honey, Georgia, from, from deep in the woods. And she goes after the voice, thinking that her mother's out there. And she searches and searches and, and finally comes back to the house, only to see that her mother's still asleep in bed. 
uh, we we now get to uh, relive that scene, but from the point of view of of the uh, adolescent boy Sasquatch who was trying to lure the the human girl out into the woods, not for any nefarious purposes, but to finally just get a look at her, separate from her house context and her the strange screen that she's always looking at, which is you know her laptop. We also see him do something else that we experienced in Act One, which is to, to take the um, antenna of, of the car, the family car, and bend it down, just like he did with the saplings, bend it over um, into an extreme uh, loop and, and wedge it tightly into the little slot between the side mirror and, and the, uh, the side of the car, which is something that happened to me here, here at my house. And we see that the father gets really pissed, and the, 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 the son, Danny, says, Look, Dad, this is exactly what, what happens to the trees in the woods. This is the same thing. And the father blames him as though he's vandalizing the car. Um, and we get to see all this now from the Sasquatch perspective. We also get to see um, Danny coming out into the woods, and now it's from the shady male's perspective, not from the adolescent boy Sasquatch's perspective. Danny coming out in the woods, lying down with his, with his um, sleeping bag, and the shady male pushing the tree down parallel to the sleeping bag. He could have killed the boy, but he, he does have some mercy in his heart, so he, he pushes it down parallel. Um, and which is what happened to me too. The, the tree was six feet, six and a half feet away from me and exactly parallel to my body and was, was thick enough so that it, it would have done me a great damage if it had come across my body. So this happens too in, in the movie. And then the dog runs after um, and we switch to um, that next morning and the Sasquatch family has essentially adopted the dog. And this um, is the first time See, when we have been with the Sasquatch family, there's no scale. Um, there's just trees and boulders and a stream and the cave, but we, they don't look to us like giants because they're all proportional to each other. And so they look like just um, hairy people, uh, which is what they are. But once the dog comes into their midst, uh, it looks like the size of a chihuahua, uh, you know, whereas it, it's, it's a, a huge 85-pound dog. Anyway... Lots of more stuff happens in Act 2, and then we move into Act 3, and I'm not going to put all that onto you. I'm going to wait and see who wants to read the whole synopsis. And, um, but suffice it to say that events escalate quickly, and there is um, eventually a, a, a burial ceremony under moonlight um, within the Sasquatch clan that we get to witness. So thanks for listening. Um, I hope that this movie will uh, one day become a reality. And I think that something like this is, has really been um, a gap in, in popular culture. And again, if you want to read the, the synopsis, please be in touch with me.